Today we're really fortunate to have David Ray with us. Uh, David Ray is the author of several books of poetry, including Wool Highways and other poems, and The Tramp's Cup, both of which received the Poetry Society of America's William Carlos Williams Award. Not far from the river from Copper Canyon Press, um, the Maharani's New Wall, Wesleyan University Press, uh, are some of the other books. Uh, the last, that book was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. Sam's book was also published by Wesleyan University Press, and that won the Maurice English Poetry Award. Um, David Ray has also received a National Endowment for the Arts Award for his fiction, and he's a professor of English at the University of Missouri, uh, Kansas City. Uh, he's won um, so many awards, it would be impossible to name them all. Um, he's certainly been an active force in poetry uh, in the United States, and I think that his poetry has in it that kind of universal quality, that ability to speak intelligently but also feelingly about being human and about the human heart. And let's welcome David Ray. Um, thanks for uh, returning what I left in there. When I write, I go into a bit of a trance and I walk off and leave things. Um, I wrote a couple of poems one time in the Austin Public Library don't let me leave that, and uh, walked off from them. And uh, I, when I went back looking, the librarian said, um, well, there was a fellow with a beard here doing some research on air conditioning, and he had a yellow pad. So I went around the streets of Austin looking for a guy with a beard and a yellow pad, uh, asking if he had my poems. Well, then I had to rewrite them, and you know, that's like trying to uh, dream the same dream a second time, so it doesn't work out. Maria was kind enough to ask me to read The Red Shoes. It all comes back to me, The Red Shoes, that film and the evening we saw it and you a dancer. You had danced on that very stage, the high school renting the theater and me feeling myself blush as you lifted your legs like the Degas dancer your little fluff skirt light as moth wings. Everyone a dancer or composer, Lermontov says you can dance, so you can go to Paris on tour. Did he add, my dear, did he add, my dear? And after that film, the rush of wings, the disappointment, did someone die, fall off the rocks at Monte Carlo? Damned if I can remember. All I know for sure is that the arts were so easy, so wonderful, just being lifted like balloons into the wind, fame and fortune, the gambling tables, immortality like stars. We drove up the mountain and you were aflame with desire to keep dancing and your blouse was quickly undone. Breast in my hand and our kiss. Then down to earth, not so firm, inquisitions for both of us, witches and wizards, beatings sustained for our love. Not all who danced were so beautiful as you, who entered the film when I lost you. The vast room of fantasy, nothing else ever. And the chorus of cactus watched, still there perhaps for the lovers, for those who have left the film, the vast room of fantasy. Return to the crust of the desert or the back seat of the car, real enough to make love in. And sometimes that's what love needs, hard reality, though what whirls on in the head is real enough too. Constellation of freckles, red hair whipped round in the wind, year after year touching my face, and blossoms of stone, petal of heartwood, eyes of agate. There's another one here uh, about a movie that I'd like to read um, called Gorillas in the Midst uh, for Jane Goodall. We watch gorillas in the mist. Evidently, it is nicer to be gorillas than to be people like us. The lady was at war with the bad people. She loved the good gorillas who beat their chests, fought for their children, died trying. But she was no match, of course, for the bad people, which seems to be the case in all the bad places that were once paradise. One sees how hard it is to save anything, a tree, a tusk, 
an infant gorilla. I'm surprised if I can save from the fire of time one poem, one shard of the jug we drank from. The lady flies into a rage, for they've attacked again those with the law on their side. The grieving babe is carried off in a crate, another theft off her sacred mountain. The bad men want heads for trophies, babies for zoos, hands for ashtrays. The hand she held, feeling that touch, that flow of one being into another, what Michelangelo painted on the ceiling. Seeing we must still look up to, something of the divine. She found it there in the jungle, but then the movie is over, and a wise one among us tells us the lady was not such a nice person. The lover in the movie was not her lover. The man that part was based on said he didn't even like her, and her hair was always unkempt. She was irrational, you might say, warring with the locals who had to make a living off gorillas. She had smoked herself so close to death that her murder was merciful, a blessing, and so on. It seems that only in movies heroes and heroines are perfect. Swift loved the horses, and she the gorillas, we say, and leave it at that. Uh, you know, that's a reference to the Wynnums uh, Jonathan Swift uh, had in Gulliver's Travels was so sure that um, they were better than people. Um, and so you see, those of you who are in the workshop, that the inner critic uh, works on people on the outside too. If, you, if you're critical toward yourself, you're going to be very critical toward others. Um, I'd like to read a few poems from Kangaroo Paws, which is the latest book. Uh, it's about Australia. Um, my wife and I lived out there for a year in Western Australia, although we, we moved around somewhat. Um, and so these poems uh, use some uh, Aussie language, some Australian. This is a poem called For Dennis. Um, and it's got an epigraph from the Australian poet Dennis Haskell, words unspoken, ashes in a jar. Amazing, a man who grieved for his father as I grieved for a son. He would gladly have leapt into the grave, changed places. And I, who always had a hollow all through my chest instead of a father, stand amazed, impressed as if at a grave's edge. I, who heard my father, like many another, had died. But only one son ever dies. Immeasurable grief swims the seas, all whales. Never a minnow swims out in that salt, where there's pain beyond belief and no relief. And here's a cheerful one called the Hemlock Society. I don't know how many of you subscribe. <laughs> She helped herself along with a few pills tucked away for just such an occasion. A very brave woman, out of it now, not wanting to become a mere vegetable, a burden to others. What are the years that they lead us only to this, the hemlock? And no one believes it when you say you are ready. Have no regrets. They themselves plan to hold on more tenaciously even while wilting to flummery, even while adding 10 tons of stone on the daughter and 10 on each son. My dearest, make sure our subscription's paid up and keep the stash handy. I love that word flummery. You know, poems are built around individual words. That word glazed makes the red wheelbarrow, doesn't it? And flummery, well, look it up yourself. It's a wonderful word. This is Jack. And um, a lot of my stuff just comes from a remark that somebody makes or uh, something of that sort. And this was one remark that I felt I had to make a case for. It's like a museum where there's something in a case and the poem is the, the case. So this is called Jack. In Australia, a scholar tells me, we're undergoing a renaissance of Kerouac. It seems they love the guy. 
And I think of Jack, slumped in his worn-out chair down in Florida, drinking and smoking himself to death, with sullen eyes watching his mother move around the room, yelling Stella at her like Marlon Brando in Streetcar. Stella would bring him his drinks and his smokes, and now and then in the rocking Florida twilight, Jack would lean forward and hug her around the hips, pressing his face against her fallen womb. Go on, Jack, she would say, her hand on his hair. Let it all out. And Jack would weep enough for both of them. Then Stella would push him away and make her rounds of the room, tipping out ashes, picking up bottles. Well, uh, let's read one more here from Kangaroo Paws. Gulliver's Travels has an epigraph from Catherine Susanna Pritchard, who's a very great novelist in Australia. It was a terrible thing men had done to the great tree. She dreaded the vengeance of the tree. <coughs> Above Perth in King's Park, near the lit up obelisk with names of the war dead, a great Kari tree lies on blocks a tribute to the logging industry of Australia. The single log is nearly 300 feet long and six feet thick, and it's a wonder how it was hauled out of the forest. By no means the largest, the bronze plaque assures. And what's it used for, I asked, this hardest and best of all woods, nearly extinct now? Toilet paper, answers my guide, most of it goes to Japan as chips for toilet paper. Next day I grieve not the war dead, flowers still left for them over three score and ten years after their war, but the logs I mourn, the gullivers men climb and crawl upon and haul out of the forest that we and the Japanese may wipe our asses smooth. <laughs> Well, Fremantle, um, near Perth, where, where we lived, is a very moody old town. Um, they used to haul a lot of whales in. And uh, so this is called Frio. And it's just imagining the uh, drunks who wandered along the streets there, because there were a lot of them. With hangover hurting, he will wake miles from Frio, thinking how cold that wind from the sea felt, although it was gentle, that sea breeze, and all in his mind. The rest of it, the convicts transported for life. They still rattled their chains, and the ghosts of whales were weeping, and yet he was only walking in moonlight down the street in old Frio. There are places that have become so touristed um, that they've completely lost any sense of what they w once were. But if you listen very closely, it's almost like you can hear the ghosts. Uh, there are a lot of places like that. Um, Hobart is one of those where they were in, uh, where they had the um, penal colony. Um, and one of the most notorious prisons in Australia. Well, uh, I'll, I'll read you one because you're writers. Uh, nobody but a writer would uh, understand this. It's called Lost. On my last day in Sydney, I grieved my lost blue notebook everywhere, made fruitless, foolish queries wherever we had been. I kept getting floors of buildings mixed up since they have a different system, walk in on two and call it ground. I've got to sit down and get centered more, I told myself, before a car clips me. They drive on the left and I step out too soon after a glance to the left, then looking right. My German friend was killed that way in London. Others put cigarettes out on their arms. 
I just write my thoughts in blue notebooks, then make sure I lose them. Ineffable grief I have suffered time and again, sharing all I am, my most intimate thoughts, seeking them down alleys, since cops always say, they throw away papers, mate, they don't want them. So some stranger winds up with those fragments and shards I need in order to glue myself back together, just to be real like some kid in a fable who doesn't want to be lost. Afflicted, abandoned, tossed out on junk heaps, scattered in alleys, or made the butt of a joke. Hey, listen to this one. In one notebook, I grieve another. In one city, remember a dark day in another. And uh, to a child of Baghdad. Our bombs may blast you to a better life. You and your vivid parrot may even change places. We give you a chance, at least, to better yourself. Who knows? You may be born beneath a lucky star next time. Maybe live in our land of milk and honey and do some bombing yourself. They say you'll die this year, that our bombs did it, the power outage, polluted water, that sort of thing. But they're stretching a point. If you knew these bombs, you would love them. We draw faces on them. We keep them spit-shined and give them pet names. And they are smart. That's how they found you. I should have put that term smart bombs in here as an epigraph because I think a lot of people don't know already. You know, these terms go out of fashion very quickly. In, in this case, thank God. I'll read one more poem from this. Uh, it's called Bad Bog. And this is about a television program. I always tell my students never write about something that's on television because it's been digested and edited and it's third hand and everything. And then I sit down and write, write about something that's on television. The programs on bad bogs, how to get out of if you're stuck in the outback, how to get back on track, get your wheels unstuck and the rest of you too. It seems there are ways of pulling yourself out of quicksand, using nothing but a rope and your own ingenuity. Who has a rope? There are times when your engine has failed, when all you can do is fix up some shade and lie in it, careful not to use up any energy. Who has energy? There are times when shade of your hats, just to start, use mud on the rest of you. There are times when a stick can dig you out, man, out of the worst mess you ever got in. Who's got a stick? There are times, mate, when a lizard's the best friend you've had ever. Who's had a friend? There are times when you boil the swamp in your billy, find it's just fine. Look for nuggets, rattle your cup, note that lizard's blue tongue, send up some smoke, next time bring a CB, or don't go out at all, not to the outback, not to the bush. In Australia, the bush has a very special meaning that's much bigger than the word. It's, it's absolutely a sum of all the things that Australians are afraid of, or that we're all afraid of, getting lost in the bush, because you probably won't get back. It's very confusing out there. Uh, I'm going way back to uh, gathering firewood here, a poem called Speaking. Have I made the mistake of trying to be too transparent to some human being? Is this why we turn to ducks that sail upon the river and manage to leave a pure V everywhere behind us, grieving waters? And this is a poem called Skid Row, and in relation to what I was saying about cutting and less being more, um, I don't know if it's true in relation to this poem, but this poem was once about three pages long. It's now four lines. <laughs> but I think it probably gets across the idea. Uh, Skid Row. Thin curtain bellowing out, endlessly begging in the night, and in the morning the last pennies out of a can for a plum. Uh, and this is WCW, 
knew a poet doesn't have to be on his best behavior all the time, has many bad poems, very lifelike, very relaxed, and breaks into song only on occasion, as all folks do, just walking along. And here's another poem about Williams. Um, I just think it's wonderful to be near those falls and uh, one of these days I'm going to get by Nine Ridge Road. Um, haven't paid homage yet. This is called Such a World to Fail. And this painter they called One Cornered Maw uh, was a master of that technique of doing something that's off in the very corner and then your mind does the imagining. Arthritic fingers, the chasm of mind. Williams, as one-cornered maw of the Sung dynasty, who painted only mind, void, the soft nothing, though scholars and a dog might stand bemused cliffside. In this valley, we see regrets everywhere, the nest made of flung hair and the frail hell of hands. How our fingers shake, our weak eyes failing the world. And, and this is a poem uh, I wrote in Greece. When I picked up a little marble fragment that was about half of a paw of a lion. And it was probably at least 2,000 years old, more like 3,000. If something is archaic, all edges have been dulled, broken by the sea, and yet some trace of the old life must be left, some evidence that this white stone was once a lion's leg or the base of an intricate temple. If that life surviving wind and sea does not lead us back in some effort to rediscover, retracking our own steps, then this something we have found in its desolation is not truly archaic. To be archaic is to exist in a state of transition between a silent life and a whispering death. Even our own bodies, when we stop and listen closely, seem to be giving off some aura of the genuinely archaic. And there's a little poem here called After Sappho. You know, when you steal something from another poet, you're supposed to say after. And um, it's just two lines. Let us live so that the rust of our bodies will rub off on others in future years. And um, Willis Barnstone, who's the translator of Sappho, uh, said to me one time, you know, I've been pondering that poem of yours uh, after Sappho. Uh, there isn't any uh, image like that in Sappho. It's yours. <laughs> well, I don't think Sappho thought much about rust. Uh, this is called The Shoelaces. Um, we were living in Spain. Uh, bending down to tie my son's shoelace where he sits in his stroller in a bar in Spain, I see below me a jumble of geologic layers and rivers of time. There are the crossbars holding the miniature and mystical cities. There is my own tweed sleeve, steel-toed shoes going back to freight-loading days. And there is this little man standing up, drunk with enthusiasm for a sick world. When I went to work at the LaSalle Street Station in Chicago as a freight loader with these steel-toed shoes, uh, one of the men said, uh, how do you like being a donkey? Because we had to pull these carts and stuff like that. This is the 4th of July. <coughs> Those. Uh, War monuments in Australia, by the way, are for World War I. And school children, even in the second and third grade, still write letters 
to the uh, fallen of World War I because Gallipoli means more to them than World War II. So they kind of skip all the other wars. But this one is World War II. The 4th of July, my uncle, Great Norman, whose leg was full of the finest German steel, broke three chairs and one table when the kids set off firecrackers on July 4th, 1946, just after apple pie. Uh, this is called a human donkey. And, and as I say, since you are writers, and we still in a way having a workshop, I'll mention how I wrote this poem, just you know, not to say it's anything of a poem, gong, but um, I was waiting to buy an airline ticket in Indian Airways office, airlines. And um, you have to wait in India two or three hours to get anything done. Uh, it's probably changed in the last 10 years because they have computers now, but at that time, uh, a clerk had to write out every airline seat on a little chart. So it took some time. So I thought, ah, rather than sit here and be bored, I'll write a poem. I didn't have a thought in my head. And so that's, I looked out the window and this is what I saw. The boy who tugs that cart along is ten perhaps, a human donkey put out to work. His bare feet pad on the hot tar of India. Great sweat drops roll off his brow. He's got a load of rolled canvas, the kind we've seen staked to corral a crowd eager to see a film or used for walls of privacy at weddings. This canvas is strong as ship sail with bright swastikas appearing in every panel for good omen. It's heavy too, as that boy's effort shows. He leans forward as if into the wind and is nearly tipped off the ground when he takes that awkward turn that will take him away from me past an angled concrete delta under giant billboard lovers who can speak only in Hindi. They almost kiss yet manage well to see out over the crowd of rickshaws. Smoke from the peanut stand obscures him now. He disappears in haze, a boy put out to labor, flagged with his blue bandana, tugging the flatbed cart that's set upon a truck's sheared off axle between two tread-worn tires at least 20 years older than this boy who's been put out to work in India. Well, I don't think Sappho thought much about rust. Uh, this is called the shoelaces. Um, we were living in Spain, uh, bending down to tie my son's shoelace where he sits in his stroller in a bar in Spain. I see below me a jumble of geologic layers and rivers of time. There are the crossbars holding the miniature and mystical cities. There is my own tweed sleeve, steel-toed shoes going back to freight-loading days. 
And there is this little man standing up, drunk with enthusiasm for a sick world. When I went to work at the LaSalle Street Station in Chicago as a freight loader with these steel-toed shoes, uh, one of the men said, uh, how do you like being a donkey? Because we had to pull these carts and stuff like that. This is the 4th of July. <coughs> Those uh, war monuments in Australia, by the way, are for World War I. And school children, even in the second and third grade, still write letters to the uh, fallen of World War I because Gallipoli means more to them than World War II. So they kind of skip all the other wars. But this one is World War II. The 4th of July, my uncle, Great Norman, whose leg was full of the finest German steel, broke three chairs and one table when the kids set off firecrackers on July 4th, 1946, just after apple pie. And this is just uh, one poem about India. We lived in India for a year and uh, it's a very powerful experience. I don't think I've gotten over India, and some of my closest relationships are uh, with friends from India. Uh, in fact, I have an Indian son-in-law now, so that's family. Uh, this is called a human donkey. And, and as I say, since you are writers, and we still, in a way, having a workshop, I'll mention how I wrote this poem, just you know, not to say it's anything of a poem, gong, but um, I was waiting to buy an airline ticket in Indian Airways office, airlines. And um, you have to wait in India two or three hours to get anything done. Uh, it's probably changed in the last 10 years because they have computers now, but at that time, uh, a clerk had to write out every airline seat on a little chart. So it took some time. So I thought, ah, rather than sit here and be bored, I'll write a poem. I didn't have a thought in my head. And so that's, I looked out the window and this is what I saw. The boy who tugs that cart along is ten perhaps, a human donkey put out to work. His bare feet pad on the hot tar of India. Great sweat drops roll off his brow. He's got a load of rolled canvas, the kind we've seen staked to corral a crowd eager to see a film or used for walls of privacy at weddings. This canvas is strong as ship sail with bright swastikas appearing in every panel for good omen. It's heavy too, as that boy's effort shows. He leans forward as if into the wind and is nearly tipped off the ground when he takes that awkward turn that will take him away from me past an angled concrete delta under giant billboard lovers who can speak only in Hindi. They almost kiss yet manage well to see out over the crowd of rickshaws. Smoke from the peanut stand obscures him now. He disappears in haze, a boy put out to labor, flagged with his blue bandana, tugging the flatbed cart that's set upon a truck's sheared off axle between two tread-worn tires at least 20 years older than this boy who's been put out to work in India. Well, I, I think I'll read you a poem I've never read in public before. Um, it's called The Hundred-Year-Old Scotch in Rajasthan. And as you might perceive from this poem, I used to have a drinking problem. <laughs> well, you might not conclude that. You make your own conclusion. When I drank the hundred-year-old Scotch, we were sitting at a 
long table on a terrace and were much admired, the turbaned Rajputs and I, by the villagers gazing over the waist-high walls. We were well served and expansive, having eaten our fill more than once and already paraded through the mud streets to the joyous accompaniment of everyone who could move, whether on crutches or carried an arm, and the music was made by whatever drum they could play or tin horn. Somehow the noise managed its message medieval. I was proud, of course, to be for once with the winners, the aristocrats. It must have been clear to all that I was the honored foreigner, and yet I was aware that it was not, so to speak, personal. Any foreigner would do. Simply being there made me a god. Well into evening, the bearers kept filling my cup, and when we moved on to the castle for dinner on a turreted roof, sitting in great easy chairs as Arab sheikhs do in movies, the food was hot with spices, so I had to drink more and more, there being no water save what was hauled from the step well. They walk in it, bathe in it, drink it. And I had already seen them bathing there, stepping down to the square pool and having a good splash, washing their hair as well as their bodies, then drinking from cupped hands. None of that stuff for me, not for a Westerner. So I kept drinking the pleasant amber-colored scotch and asking of one beaming host after another if this was not indeed the hundred-year-old scotch, and was assured again and again I was in effect drinking pure gold, liquefied. Dawn found me walking out under palms through the fields, for all India as a toilet has been well and accurately said. The man at my side on a similar quest, a Rajput aristocrat with great mustaches and bronze skin said, Saab, we are so happy you are alive this morning. <laughs> now maybe that's where the poem should end, but I'm going to go ahead and read the rest of it. <laughs> We thought you would surely be dead. I had one hell of a headache and I trembled, but the main thing was that I needed a place in the fields to squat. Others were already busy at it, spread out, each with a little bucket set beside him, water for washing. What do you mean, I asked. That hundred-year-old scotch was terrific, but I drank more than I should. Headache was not all that I throbbed from, and the man laughed like a demon of sorts. He stopped in the sun, rising, gilding the fields. Then he laughed wildly, almost in hysterics. Hundred-year-old Scotch sob. That was only our first drink. The rest was from here in the village. They used the old car radiators for distillers. <laughs> Already this year, six die in this village alone. The lead in those car parts, it is poison, Saab. But why, I asked him almost in tears, not sure now I'd live to eat breakfast or until noon or even until I managed to squat in the field. Why did that bearer keep serving? Oh, Saab, the Rajput explained, you liked it a lot. We Rajputs could see that and we remarked to each other how happy you were. That bearer, he wished to be nice. Nice, I yelled, knowing maybe I'd die from it. Oh yes, he said, for that is our custom. We must always be nice. I was not well enough to continue our discourse, so I staggered on till a few riverside rushes gave me the chance to touch Mother Earth and deposit half or more of my body. Then some of my tears, while much of me died there, came to know what the phrase meant. 100 years of solitude, <laughs> which I then suffered within one square yard of Indian earth, and yet I recall it gleaming like gold, the first glass of that hundred-year-old scotch in Rajasthan, and how those eyes over the wall admired and envied me for drinking it, holding the glass up for another, and another, and another. <clears throat> I really uh, did think I was going to die from that. Um, I'll read just a few poems from Sam's book. Um, poems for my son. Many of them were written uh, while he was alive and I just put them together. Um, and some are, are working through the grief which 
never ends, as you know. Uh, the temple at Pistum. Son, forgive me if for a moment when we saw the temple at Pistum on the sea, I thought the steps worn on that stone had been by your ancient feet which ran before me. You know, somebody asked um, the guru, what's the secret of happiness? And he said, uh, grandfather die, father die, son die. The man said, that doesn't sound very happy. Uh, and the guru said, would you have it in any other order? <laughs> and this is brief song. There will come a day when you would have lived your life all the way through, mine long gone, and peace will descend then, such a great peace like a breath, moving those pines, moving even the stone, and then, then I can let go. And this is the question. How long should I mourn? Let me ask you, my son, how long would you wish it? Do you want it to go on? Is there anything to be gained for either of us, for both of us? Are you so far away now that you're no more than a wish? The one I had on my mind before you fulfilled it came quite early one morning when mist was on fields and we had slept there waiting in a tent for you yet rushed into the town as if a boy like you could not have appeared out of the fields, blue mists not far from the ocean. And this is a poem that sort of interfaces with the, the India books. Uh, it's called Bhopal. And I can never quite get over how we split our own sufferings from those of others. You know, in the Bhagavad Gita, they say, um, the most amazing thing is that every man understands how the other man can die. And someone said, the only reason we can have war is that every man or every young man can be convinced that it is quite possible that the man at his side on either side of him may be killed in battle. So this is Bhopal um, with an epigraph from Clough who's no longer read. I've often wondered how it is at times good people do what are as bad as crimes. And this is a sonnet. Eyes open, glazed like Isinglass, the fire behind gone out. This child of Bhopal lies in his shallow grave of cinders. No time for weeping as when we lost our son Sam and stood hands joined to wish him well in some life beyond. In fact, he might have gone on to Bhopal, just in time to die again at just three months. Not likely, but who knows. One thing that's certain, though, is this. Third world or one beyond, they're all our children now. Though born by millions in brown arms and black, and not much mourned by those who think their own are wonders, others somehow less, and thus I'll say goodbye to this son too, and yours. I think we've all been doing that to that uh, Oklahoma child, the picture that's become so famous in the last couple of weeks. I, I guess these fancy deconstructionists use the term icon. That will become an icon for, for our year here. This is another trick of the mind, and actually this poem is based on something that's a serious suggestion from a grief book I was reading. Out of a book, a little trick. Instead of the picture and much longing for that lost face, place yourself within the frame. You're back together again, if only in the past or in the dream, 
or this gilded picture in mind, but it is no longer a dream or a picture of loss. And then you go on down the road you have to go together. Neighbors. Um, this sort of continues the theme that's in Bhopal there. The bitterness. Um, since my son was killed, I've had three different friends come up to me and say, I'm really sorry. I apologize. Because when you went through that, I had no idea what you were going through. And now I'm in your shoes. Because they lost children. And they didn't understand it until they did. This is true, of course, of, of any suffering. You take alcoholism. Um, George McGovern um, is writing a book about the death of his daughter who died in an alcoholic accident. You know, she was drunk and fell down in the snow and so forth. And my son died in an alcoholic accident. And so he, um, he he's uh, had an assistant calling me and talking about it because he's, uh, he, he likes these poems. And um, uh, I haven't talked to him yet, but when I do, uh, what she says to me is that he's blaming himself. And what I want, plan to say to him is, you know, if you're not an alcoholic, and of course he isn't, um, you can never know how impossible it is for anybody else to get at your problem. You're the only one who can help yourself if you're an addict. So if one really understands that, then maybe survivor's guilt will diminish. Anyway, um, this is called neighbors. <clears throat> neighbors who pretend not to know what kind of neighbors are those who sneak curious glances, who offer no word of goodwill? Some of them work, by the way, at Hallmark, famous for greeting us, yet not one word from them out of their mouths or etched in pastel. I pass them with children, their strollers or bikes slowed for riding beside. And I, as I say, the mother's sneak glances measure perhaps my dark envy how I would wish theirs dead to bring my son back. And there is nothing to say, nothing to trade, for nothing, not a word in return, for no neighborly word. Well, I'll end with this uh, poem from Sam's book called In the Children's Library. Sam, retreating to find a room away from murmurous girls, loud whispers, music leaking from earphones, while mid-afternoon browsers of Sweetbriar lounge. I come to the bright room kept for children, wonderful books I did not read as a child. You got through some of them in the novel you started in the eighth grade, reflected your love of Tolkien and White and Farrah John, and you loved black beauty at least as much as equestrian scholars here who cross the campus in boots, jodhpurs, cute little black jockey caps fastened at chin. I sit by the window open to leaves falling, now and then one upon the window ledge. Oak tables are small and the squat chairs strong. And I could have led you in 10 years ago while you lived and there was much hope ahead. Then I noticed a book propped recommended you come too, with Frost's darkest poems inside. Those you copied out on a cypress root and a birch slab. Come in to the dark and dust of snow, as if from the pine where you lie. I read them now, these poems you so loved, lived and died by, and see that the book has been stamped for grades seven, eight, and nine as if an old man reading and seeking your guidance and frosts were robbing the cradle of wisdom. I read them for you, son who taught me to weep, who taught me to say these prayers for the dark. Thank you. Well, someone said that a poem is a moment's monument, and I think that's probably true. 
So uh, I've had a lot of uh, moments to write monuments about. Uh, I've lived in several countries, so a lot of those um, places have been very inspiring. Um, a couple of my books are about India, uh, one's about Australia, one's about New Zealand. Uh, when you travel, things are very, very vivid. And um, so yes, I'd, I'd agree that uh, you write about those moments that hit you very hard. And poets are more thin-skinned than other people. So they get hit harder and more often. Well, how does one survive that? Uh, I, I don't know. It's a, it's a mystery. It's a real mystery. But as I was saying to this workshop, it's really a life and death decision all the time. Because you either have to be affirmative and get on with things or give in to those negative voices and the negative influences that are around us. Because goodness knows there are plenty and and they've destroyed a lot of poets a lot of poets have self-destructed because they're so sensitive their sensitivity makes them vulnerable to the hazards the addictions and the pressures but in, 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 that is being sensitive is that also part of what helps us kind of look at something or an object and say there's something that I have to write about it. Right. We just have to learn how to manage it better. Yeah, it's not a conscious decision. The, the thing takes you. You don't take it. I mean, it grabs you. Uh, Henry James said, try to be one of those on whom nothing is lost. But of course you'd go crazy if, if you really followed that. But things uh, jump up at you. Um, it's, uh, it's very much, I think, like the work of a photographer. He sees something and he has to take a picture of it. It's not a conscious choice. How much has travel, or how much, or how, how much has travel done mm. for you? And would you suggest that to others uh, in, order, in order for them to open up their world? That's a real tough one because uh, I guess I'm kind of addicted to it. I'm going to uh, Scotland and France coming up for, for residencies and places for writers. And uh, so I guess I could say I'm a, an addict of travel. But uh, I still have second thoughts about it. I might have been wiser just to stay at home. Um, and when we went to India 10 years ago, I must say, we had two daughters with us. One was 19 and one was 16, 15. The 19-year-old promptly fell in love with an Indian boy, wound up marrying him, so she loved India. And she still loves India, and she likes to go to India and stuff, so we have India in the family. The 15-year-old has never forgiven us for taking her to India. So we've got both sides of the coin right there in the family. So. That's the ambivalence that I feel. I feel both sides of that. Uh, in some ex to some extent, why, why did we put ourselves through this? And on the other hand, wasn't it beautiful? And you feel both of those. Yeah. In your workshop, you were talking about what you thought poetry, um, what you think poetry is, and how you define a poem or, or poetry. And I wonder if you want to talk about that a little bit. Well, um, poetry is just more condensed, elevated. I don't want to say elevated. It's just a more intense language and more tightly framed. Uh, Thomas McGrath, the late Thomas McGrath, who was a great poet, used to say, you can start the poetry now. And everybody knew what he meant. Everybody knew what not poetry was. Uh, and in a workshop like the one we just had, one of the things I asked them after they read their poems was where does your voice change from poetry to just prose or explanation or analysis? And all of them knew. They knew right away. So it's, it's, it's a different kind of language. Uh, Hausman said poetry is what makes your whiskers stand up. Um, so you know what it is. And um, uh, about 20 people in the workshop read their poems and I asked them which ones made you really feel something and once more uh, they knew exactly 
So um, poetry is that language which can bridge that gap between two people, whether it's over 2,000 years and a language barrier or just across a table. And you never know. I mean, as a poet yourself, Maria, you know that uh, you can't predict it. You never know what will get through to somebody and what won't. The things that I think are sure things, I can't even get published. The, maybe something that I wrote in a very offhand moment, somebody will come up to me that I've never met and say, that made me weep, or thank you for writing that, or something of that sort. So you never know. And sometimes, of course, you, you regret having this, this book, Sam's book, uh, which was basically part of the grief work for my son's death 10 years ago. I wish I hadn't had to write. And yet that's the one that people write to me about and has brought me close to a lot of people because they've had similar losses. So you, you cannot predict. You can't prophesize. You can't prognosticate. And certainly as a teacher, you can't decide who's going to be terrific and who's going to be a deadbeat. You just can't do it. I know a lot of teachers who think they can't, but that's playing God in my opinion. present today Ruth Stone. Um, Ruth Stone's newest book is called Simplicity and it'll be out next week. Um, her last collection of poems uh, was called Who is the Widow's Muse and there are copies of that available on the table in the back and it won the Best American Poetry of 1991 award. She also won the Whiting Foundation Award and the Patterson Poetry Prize. Um, Ruth Stone's poetry has been anthologized in many books, including the Norton Anthology of Literature by Women and recent volumes of The Best Year in American Poetry. Uh, Ruth is a professor of creative writing at the State University of New York at Binghamton. If you're interested in her new book, uh, you can order copies uh, by giving us a check. We'll send it on to the publisher who will send you an autographed uh, copy of Ruth's book. Um, I just had the pleasure of reading the book Galleys last night, and it's an incredible book, really incredible book. Uh, what else? Oh, um, so I think before I allow Ruth to come up here and read her poems, I'd, I'd like to say that it seems to me that in um, 
a period of time when so many people are writing poetry. There still are very few really original, vibrant, uh, daring voices, and I think that Rousteau is one of them. Let's welcome Rousteau. Good advice. <clears throat> here is not exactly here, because it passed by there two seconds ago, where it will not come back. Although you adjust to this, it's nothing you say, just the way it is. How poor we are with all this running through our fingers. Here, says the devil, eat it paradise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's see, I made a little list hastily. Here it is. And I will read, uh, I hope it isn't too many, a few poems from a uh, secondhand coat. I'll read The Nose, which I've read before many times, but it's an okay poem. Still true. The Nose. Everyone complains about the nose. If you notice it is stuck to your face, in the morning it will be red. If you are a woman, you can cover it with makeup. If you are a man, it means you had a good time last night. Noses are phallic symbols, so are fingers, monuments, trees, and cucumbers. The familiar he knows his stuff should be looked into. There is big business in nose jobs, the small nose having gained popularity during the Christian boom. <laughs> Noses get out of joint, but a broken nose is never the same thing as a broken heart. They say, bless your heart, shake hands, blow your nose. When kissing, there is apt to be a battle of wills over which side your nose will go on. While a nosebleed next to a good cry is a natural physic, a nosy person smells you out and looking down your nose will make you cross-eyed. Although the nose is no longer used for rooting and shoving, it still gets into some unlikely places. The old sayings, he won by a nose and he cut off his nose to spite his face, illustrate the value of the nose. In conclusion, three out of four children are still equipped with noses at birth, and the nose, more often than not, accompanies the body to its last resting place. <laughs> okay, uh, mine. Oh, I forgot to say which page it's on. Oh, sh mine. I'll have to look it up now. Uh, hmm. I know it's here. Oh, it must be an older one. Mine, 79. Okay. Mine. <clears throat> Sick at heart, I lie down among those who dream of murder. While I am sleeping, they take away my blankets. The sparrows fly up from the snow and hunch in the bushes. I walk slowly away shivering. I have died ahead of my body. It drags behind me. Come, they say, hiding their smiles. Surely you can do something about this bloody thing that is following you. You know it is yours. Uh, 47. This one is called Turn Your Eyes Away. The gendarme came to tell me you had hung yourself on the door of a rented room, like an overcoat, like a bathrobe hung from a hook. When they forced the door open, your feet pushed against the floor. Inside your skull, there was no room for us. Your circuits forgot me. Even in Paris, where we never were, I wait for you, knowing you will not come. I remember your eyes as if I were someone you had never seen, a slight frown between your brows considering me. How could I have guessed the plain spoken stranger in your face, your body tagged in a drawer, attached to nothing, incurious? My sister, my spouse, you said, in a place on the other side of the earth where we lay in a single bed, unable to pull apart, breathing into, into each other, the Gideon Bible open to the song of songs, the rush of the L train jarring the window, as if needles were stuck in the pleasure zones of our brains. We repeated everything over and over and over. <laughs> and this one's called Curtains. 
putting up new curtains, other windows intrude, as though it is that first winter in Cambridge when you and I had just moved in. Now, cold borscht alone in a bare kitchen. What does it mean if I say this years later? Listen, last night I am on a crying jag with my landlord, Mr. Tempesta. I sneaked in two cats. He screams, no pets, no pets. I become my Aunt Virginia, proud but weak in the head. I remember Anna Magnani. I throw a few books, I shout. He wipes his eyes and opens his hands. Okay, okay, keep the dirty animals, but no nails in the walls. We cry together. I am so nervous, he says. I want to dig you up and say, look, it's like the time, remember, when I ran into our living room naked to get rid of that fire inspector? See what you miss by being dead? And this one is called The Widow's Song. Uh, this is The Widow's Song. As I was a springbok, I am a leper. As my skirt lifted up as a veil, so the shawl of a widow. As the ox lip, so the buffalo grass. As the wall of a garden in winter, so was I, hidden. As the game of the keeper, not counted, so I am without number, as the yellow star grass. Okay, then I will read. Mm. Now how did I have this figured? Whoops, was that the order? I don't know if this was the order or not, but here it is. It can't be. Wait a minute, all right, I'll do it this way. Okay. Against loss. That time at the downbeat, Billy Holiday. Oh, nothing is succulent and sweet anymore. We drank so much. This was before the war, when we were renting rooms for the weekends, and you watched me brush my hair, tickling your long fingers down my back. I sometimes hear the trombone and sax and drums, the wobble of spinning glass above the ladies' room where she was upending a little toff of medicine out of a bottle. I mean, Billie Holiday spoke to me down there. She said, I've got a bad cough, like an apology, and I remember her. Memory becomes the exercise against loss. Later, when we were naked on the bed, and that tremble of heat lightning along the muscles, you began the slow measures of Dover Beach in the only voice, the only voice. Ah, oh, love, let us be true to one another. <laughs> you stop that. Plumbing. Plumbing is so intimate. He hooks up your toilet. He pl is this echoing too much? No, I was feeling the same thing up there, but it doesn't. Is that all right? Uh, plumbing is so intimate. He hooks up your toilet. He places a wax ring under the vitria seat where your shit will go. You are grateful to him. He is a god with wrenches, a quiet young man using a flame torch. He solders the joints. He crawls through your dusty attic over the boxes of doll furniture, the trains, the ripped sleeping bag, the beetle po posters, the camp cots, the dishes, the bed springs to wire up the hot water tank. And you admire him as you would St. Francis for his simple acceptance of how things are. And the water comes like a miracle. Each time in the night with your bladder full, you rise from the bed and instead of the awful stench of the day before and perhaps even the day before that, in a moment of pure joy, you smell nothing but the sweet mold of an old house and your own urine as it sloshes down with the flush and you feel comfortable, taken care of, like some rich Roman matron who had just been loved by a boy. <laughs> and this is called That Winter. In Chicago near the lake on the North Shore, your shotgun apartment has a sunroom where you indulge in a cheap chaise lounge and read of human bondage. There is a window in the living room proper cracked open so your Persian cat can go outside. 
You are on the first floor and upstairs, a loud mouth southern woman whose husband is away all week on business trips, has brought her maid up from Georgia to do the work and take care of the baby. Oh Lord, the southern woman says, he wants it spotless on the weekend. The maid, who has smooth brown skin, is not allowed to sit on the toilet. But she feeds the kid and changes the dirty diapers. She washes the dishes. She cooks the southern meals. She irons the sheets for the mahogany bed. The southern woman shouts at her in a southern drawl, Junie, don't sit on that chair. You'll bust it. The southern woman is at loose ends five days waiting for him to come in. Like a honeymoon, honey, she says, when he grabs me, hooey. She invites you up and makes sure you understand the fine points of being a white woman. I can't let her live here, not in Chicago. I made her go out and get herself a room. She's 17. She bellered and blubbered. Now I don't know what she's tracking in from men. It is winter. The ice stacks up around the retaining wall. The lake slaps over the park benches, blocks of ice green with algae. You are getting your mail secretly at a postal box because your lover is in the Aleutians. It's during the war, and your disgusting husband works at an oil refinery on the south side. Up there in the Aleutians, they are knocking the gold teeth out of the dead Japanese. One construction worker has a skin bag with 50 gold-filled teeth. He pours them out at night in his Quonset hut. He brags about bashing their faces in. One day, you are fooling around in a downtown music store, waiting for the war to end. You let a strange teenage boy talk you into going home with him. He lives alone in a basement behind the square of buildings. He shows you his knife collection and talks obsessively about Raskolnikov. Suddenly, your genes want to live, and you pull away and get out of there. It is almost dusk. You run until you find the boulevard sluggish with the 1943 traffic. You know by now there isn't much to live for except to spite Hitler. The war is so lurid that everything else is dull. For eight women, <clears throat> gender loyalty, alien to the pits and ducks of ourselves, how to unscrew this pattern? Now here's another matter, the season of bagworms, and yet the moths were so random, so azure. One lives alone out of circumstance until the face in the multiple mirrors is sourdough full of its own gas. The ocean is near, swallowing everything, a little cup of water moving along the galaxy. In Morocco, my child goes down to the beach toward evening. She forgets her tormentor, the headmaster's wife. The ocean takes her, the broth of itself flowing inside her. She rests with her feet in this gallops of water. I cannot consider Kana, Alice, or Shoko without their Len, Basho, or Connie Smith. What is this pattern in the light of bagworms? Nevertheless, the mornings here are a sweet shock to the blood. Light as it falls on the louvered windows, a pattern of slits, and above that, the balconies. For a short time, you are a stranger. Then the vision fades. Then you become the door opening and closing. In the mountains, on my way home from the village, I would pass my sister's grave. Embalming fluid is pink like antifreeze. How red she looked in the casket. Next year, her grave site caved in. She stood on her head in the box. The sexton dumped in more dirt. Dirt, dirty, soil is so useful. We track it in. The white carpet grows yellow. Down here in the south, along highways and boulevards, crepe myrtle. I am a stranger crossing the bone bridge to meet the other. Our skulls shine like calligraphy in a longed-for language. This is called re resonance. The universe is sad. I heard it when Arthur Rubinstein played the piano. He was a little man with small hands. We were bombing Germany by then. I went to see him in a dark warehouse where a piano had been placed for his practice or whatever he did before a recital. 
he signed the book I had with me. It was called Warsaw Ghetto. I later heard about him, his affairs with young women, if only I had known. But I was in love with you. Arthur is dead, and you, my darling, the imprint of your face, alert like a deer. Oh God, it is eaten away. The earth has taken it back. But I listened to Arthur. He springs out of the grave, his genius wired to this tape, a sad trick of the neural pathways resonating flesh, and my old body remembers the way you touched me. This is called News. What have you to say to that contorted, gunned down pile of rags in a road, possibly nameless, even to the one who throws it on a cart and pushes it away? The discarded New York Times is wrapped around your garbage, a now wet on the scene still from someone's news camera stained with scraps from your kitchen. And whose illusion that woman running with the child already struck, the machine gun crossing the line of her body, yet she does not fall, although she is already dead. Her history written backward. There is no time to weep for her. This was once the snot of semen, the dim blue globe of the egg moving through the fallopian tube, that single body casting itself into the future. Did I read things I say to myself when hanging laundry yet? No, I didn't, no. Things I say to myself while hanging laundry. Am I reading too long? No. If an ant crossing on the clothesline from apple tree to apple tree would think and think, it probably could not dream up Albert Einstein or even his sloppy mustache or the wrinkled skin bags under his eyes that puffed out years later after he dreamed up that maddening relativity. Even laundry is three-dimensional. The ants cross its great fibrous forest from clothespin to clothespin, carrying the very heart of life in their sacks or mandibles, the very heart of the universe in their formic acid molecules. And how refreshing the linens are, lying in the clean sheets at night when you seem to be the only one on the mountain and your body feels the smooth touch of the bed like love against your skin, and the heavy sack of yourself relaxes into its embrace. When you turn out the light, you are blind in the dark, as perhaps the ants are blind, with the same abstract leap out of this limiting dimension, so that the very curve of light as it is pulled in the dimple of space is relative to your own blind pathway across the abyss. And there in the dark is Albert Einstein with his clever formula that looks like little mandibles digging tunnels into the earth and bringing it up grain by grain, the crystals of sand exploding into white, hot, radiant turbulence, smiling at you, his shy, bushy smile along an imaginary line from here to there. <laughs> Nuns at lunch on the bus. First they unzip the dark suitcase, and the more sedate one pulls out the plastic bag. The other one zips the reticule and stretches to put it up on the rack. With a smile, she looks around. It is a small congratulation. Then they sit together. A paper napkin is spread on each ample lap. There is a momentary pause, almost breathless, and then their delicate flesh fingers hold the sandwiches. As they bite, they brush away the crumbs. Their jaws, sensuous and steady, masticate the ham and cheese. They wear draped, heavy head covers, dark coats, and sensible dark Oxford shoes. Under their habits, beige skin, the beige of their plump bodies, matrons who have given themselves. Under their dark belts, below the layers of man-made fibers, under their modest belly buttons, the unscarred skins of their stomachs, their organs, finally satiated, begin spasms of kneading, softening the mass with pepsins and acids, shoving it down into the bowels. Now they pour coffee into styrofoam and lift it to their lips. 
Then, mother of us all, some little chocolate cakes come peeping forth and are tucked into their benevolent mouths with a gentle sucking and swallowing. And then they tidy up. The thermos top is screwed on, the lint brushed, paper napkins touched to their faces, their fingers, the plastic pouch is stowed away, and they settle to their deeper contemplations, the body of truth, the temporal body, the vessel of love. <laughs> this is called the sperm and the egg. The sperm hate the egg, they are afraid of it, and ogress they clop the hot red ante room, clinging to the walls. She is blue and pulsing. They are small and inadequate and lose their tails. Their chlorine milk begins to spoil. But on the journey, when the shudder swept them into an excited knot and expelled them all together, early sight scattered ahead of them. They traveled like a shower of comets. It was as if they were the universe. The egg puts out her slimy pseudopod and takes the sperm into the jelly. The sperm is hysterical. Now the egg is busy changing shape. The sperm does not want to be pulled apart into strings. Don't unravel me, it cries. The egg does not hear it. Deep inside the sperm, a seething hatred for the egg. When I had my tail, I was free, the sperm cries. It remembers the ultimate vast trajectory. It remembers them all crying, to be or not to be. <laughs> uh, living space. Up here, the folks who live in trailers are often large, fat folks, but sometimes they are wizened older men living alone. The trailer is often close to the road, and often when the snow melts, a confusion of cast-off tires, a sagging woodshed, and the brilliance of plastic that floated from passing hot rods during the long winter afflicts a naked sadness. Inside the trailer, it will be overwarm with wall-to-wall -wall red carpeting, the kitchen end snug with a maple table and chairs, electric, electro perk, and a tree of coffee mugs. With certain trailers toward evening, several men will be standing near the road. A car has stopped and the ones in the car lean out and those on the bare ground in front of the trailer, the spot that will later bloom with orange daylilies, will seem to be settling some intricate problem in motors. There will be another car and a truck. The hood of a blousy Plymouth will be up. Regular traffic slows down to get past and the people driving by, if they look, can see hairy arms and thick fingers upending cans of beer. The skinny owner of one of the cars will be leaning back against the trailer, dragging on a cigarette and shouting, hey Bucky, to a Buick that screeches to a stop and then guns on. Or a trailer can be fronted with a small porch with iron railings and pots of geranium and fluffy white curtains at the windows. Its owners are almost never visible, though often it too is close to the road. The trailers with children running in and out usually have a beaten, defeated patch of grass and almost always a dog tied up without any water or food in its plastic dog bowls. For those on a low fixed income, trailers are almost as affordable as small houses used to be. If they catch fire, they are apt to burn at white heat. Like other people, the people who live in trailers may have rectangular minds, modules for large color TVs. The bottom heavy young wives may shop in the evening at Ames. There are small children playing hide and seek in the racks of nylon pantsuits. They live in another space. They have settled close to the earth. They have retained their rugged American rights to their own home. Often elderly couples have traded a trailer for a camper and drive south in cold weather. There are whimsical vehicles wagging down the crowded lanes, while up front their stiff silver-haired profiles are pointed like migrating lemmings toward that which is always out there in the great American dark. <laughs> that was Maria published that in her little magazine. Yeah. Okay, not little magazine, big magazine. The sad voice of the Hubble. Do you know the Hubble telescope? The sad voice of the Hubble. 
as I am the eyes of your eyes, as I am the eyes of your eyes, searching for black holes, darkness that is and is not, iris of swallowed light, so beneath me the mortal wounds, the malaise of the parent body, its sensual skin of sadness. The radiation that touches the body, the body of this illusion, is the random of photons singing. With your wrinkled palms, with your stiff extended fingers, you rose and floated around me, strange bulky angels. As I am born out here on the violence of consuming, the violence of starvation, I am here like the suave mortician to help you pick out the casket. Uh, this is called for my dead red-haired mother. I loved a red-haired girl. Freud knew it was a wicked thing to do. This is how all poems begin. Sometime after the age of two, I beat the atom in me black and blue. Infant, wicked infant, I threw my love outside and grew into a bride. You and I, reflecting in our bones, the sea and sky, we dressed ourselves as flesh, we learned to lie. Dearly beloved, forgive me for that mean and meager self that now would mingle but must first die. myself. Thursday the 20th of July came to me and said, I will give you this one elastic day. Snap it shut or stretch it like bread dough. So I put my hands in kneading and pulling. It was a gauze bag day. The be blue bell flower opened at the tip of its stalk. I am a body not equipped to take every flag downhill, but looking at all the exits and entrances, I chose white wine in a plain glass goblet, and wearing a flannel nightgown, I went barefoot into the uncut grass. The temperature rose. The yeast began to work. Every spider took to the air. The cells of my skin puffed and tugged, and with a great shout let go their tethers, until looking up, I saw myself like a cloud, like ectoplasm, like an angel among the branches of trees. Then, peeling layer after layer, I went to it letting go until only the elemental worm remained, letting itself down on a string of spittle. And this is called Coffee and Sweet Rolls. When I remember the dingy hotels where we lay reading Baudelaire, your long elegant fingers, the nervous ritual of your cigarette, you, a young poet working in the steel mills, me married to a dull chemical engineer. Fever of having nothing to lose, no luggage, a few books, the streetcar. In the manic shadow of Hitler, the guttural monotony of war, often just enough money for the night. Rising together in the clanking elevators to those rooms where we lay like embryos, helpless in the desire to be completed, to be issued out into the terrible world. All night sighing and waking, insatiable. At daylight, counting your change, you would go for coffee. Then, lying alone, I heard the sirens, the common death of everything, and again, the little girl I didn't know, all in white, in a white casket, 
the boy I once knew smashed with his motorcycle into the pavement and what was said made a wax figure for his funeral came into me. I had never touched the dead. Always the lock unclicked and you were back, our breakfast in a paper sack. What I waited for was the tremor in your voice. In those rooms with my eyes half open, I memorized for that austere and silent woman who waited in the future, who for years survived on this fiction. So even now, I can see you standing thin and naked, the shy flush of your rising cock pointed toward heaven as you pull down the dark window shade. My, the solution, my friend the supermarket talks to me through my friend the television set. Did I read this one? No. So a solution. My friend the supermarket talks to me through my friend the television set. They tell me I am not lonely. Come to me, super says. Have an electric clock and a big cucumber. Very cheap. You can set yourself to go off with the alarm. They take me in my sleep to the shopping plaza and show me temptations in plastic. All this can be yours, they say. Gorge yourself. And uh, here are some little new ones, a couple. Words. Wallace Stevens says, a poet looks at the world as a man looks at a woman. I can never know what a man sees when he looks at a woman. That is a sealed universe. On the outside of the bubble, everything is stretched to infinity. Along the blacktop, trees are bearded as old men, like rows of nodding gray-bearded mandarins. Their second-hand beards were spun by gyp female gypsy moths. All mandarins are trapped in their images. A poet looks at the world as a woman looks at a man. This is called Up There. Belshazzar saw this blue as he came into the walled garden, though outside all was yellow, sunlight striking the fractals of sand, the wind striating the sand in riffles. Land changes slowly, the fathoms overhead accruing particles reflecting blue or less blue. Vapor, a transient thing, a dervish seen rising in a whirl of wind, or brief cloud casting its changing shadow, though below the open mouthed might stand transfixed by, by mirage, a visionary oasis. Nevertheless, this deep upside down wash, watercolor above planted gardens, tended pomegranates, rouged soles of the feet of lovers lounging in an open tent, the hot blue above the harem, tethered and restless as camels. This quick vision between walls, event, freak ball, shook jar of vapor. All those whose eyes were not gouged out have looked up and seen within the cowl this tenuous wavelength. You wanted me to read Mahalovich? An older poem? Okay. Uh, let's see. This is called Translations. Here it is. Forty-five years ago, <coughs> Alexander Mihailovich Taritsyn, son of a white Russian owner of a silk stocking factory in Constantinople, we rumpled your rooming house bed, sneaked past your landlady and turned your plaster Madonna to the wall. Are you out there, short, vulgar, civil engineer? Did you know I left you for a Princeton geologist who called me girly? Ten years later, he was still in the Midwest when he died under a rock fall. I told you I was pregnant. You gave me money for the abortion. I lied to you. I needed clothes to go out with the geologist. You called me Kushka, little cat. Sometimes I stopped by the civil engineering library where you sat with other foreign students. You were embarrassed my husband might catch you. He was in the chemistry lab with his Bunsen burner boiling water for tea. Alexander Mihailovich Turitsyn, fig of my pallid college days, plum of my head. Did the silk stocking factory go up in flames? Did the German fox jump out of the desert sleeve and gobble your father up? 
Are you dead? Second-hand engine, formula concrete. We were still meeting in stairwells when the best chess player in Champaign-Urbana went to the Spanish Civil War. He couldn't resist heroic gestures. For years, I was haunted by the woman who smashed her starving infant against the Spanish wall. Cautious stayed Mihailovich, so quick to pick my hairpins out of your bed. Average lover, have your balls decayed? Mihailovich, my husband, the chemist with light eyes and big head, the one whose body I hated, came back in the flesh 15 years ago. He was wearing a tight Western shirt he had made himself. There wasn't anything he couldn't do. He talked about wine and cheese tasting parties. We folk danced at a ski lodge. So this is life, I said. He told my daughter he was her daddy. It wasn't true. You're all so boring. My friend from Japan, Kanamaida, the scholar of classical haiku, whose fingers, whose entire body had been trained to comply, her face pale without powder, her neck so easily bent. After she died from the radiation, her translations of Basho were published by interested men who failed to print her correct name. So the narrow book appears to have been written by a man. Faded in these ways, she is burned on my flesh, as kimonos were burned on the flesh of women in the gamma rays of Hiroshima. She wasn't one of those whose skin peeled in the Holocaust, whose bones cracked. Graceful and obscure, she was among all those others who died later. Where are you, my repulsive white Russian? Are you also lost? Pimpled, obscene boy, Employed at an early age by your father, you pandered his merchandise on trays, using your arm as a woman's leg slipped inside a silk stocking with a woman's shoe on your hand. Do you understand that later I lived with a transvestite, a hairdresser who wore wigs? When he felt that way, he would go out and pick up an English professor. After we quarreled, I cut up his foam rubber falsies. I had a garage sale while he was out of town. I sold his mail order high heels, his corsets, his sequined evening gowns. Those afternoons in bed, listening to your memories of prostitutes with big breasts, how you wanted to roll on a mattress of mammary glands. The same when Rip Hansen told me about the invasion of France. Crossing the channel, he saw infantry falling past him from split open cargo planes, still clinging to tanks and bulldozers. Statistical losses figured in advance. The ripped open remnants of a Russian girl nailed up by the Germans outside her village, also ancient, indigenous. But what can I tell you about death? Even your sainted mother's soft doe body, her flower-dusted breasts, by now are slime paths of microorganisms. Where were you when they fed the multitudes to the ovens? Old fetid fish eyes, did they roll you in at the cannery? Did you build their bridges or blow them up? Are you burned to powder? Were you mortarized? Did you die in a ditch, Mihailovich? Are you exorcised? Poor, innocent lecher, you believed in sin. I see you rising with the angels, thin, forgotten, dirty-fingered son of a silk-stocking factory owner in Constantinople. May you be exonerated. May you be forgiven. May you be a wax taper in paradise. Alexander Mihailovich Doritza. <laughs> when, you know, when I first began to write, of course, I was a child. and. Uh, it was all uh, received through my ear. Uh, I mean, I heard the poems and it was music probably. And uh, so I didn't ever think about what I was saying, but just musically writing it down and it was musical. Uh, it happened to make sense, but probably grew out of, you know, just everything I had ever read, uh, you know, and so forth or heard. Um, I did notice over the a period of time, for instance, when I, I poems used to come to me in um, a, a, a rush. I knew I would know they were coming, and then they would come already, already written in my head without my knowing it. So it was a rush, 
and I would feel that, and uh, I, I would feel them coming. Uh, after, um, I, I think up into my 20s, or at least mid 20s, they stopped doing that specific thing. Um, they didn't come so obviously in the rush. I would get a funny feeling and they would come. It's always had a distinct, other people have mentioned this too with themselves, a distinct, uh oh, uh, yeah, a, a poem, you know. But early on, it was uh, an incredible thing. I would feel it from a far distance coming toward me, uh, real strong. Um, Anyway, how does the, I, I'm thinking about how my poetry changed. I think that I accepted uh, through my ear my poetry for many years. Um, uh, they came out whole and I do not think I worked on them. They, they were more or less musical. I think they were songs of some sort. It was musical. Uh, not melody, but musical language, and they worked. And also, I used to get incredible last lines would come to them too, you know. At a certain point a few years ago, my last lines quit doing that. And it was maddening because instead of getting, you know, these terrific, so seeming terrific last lines, the poem would just sort of hang there toward the end and I had to fight for it. Uh, I think also that um, m m my mental processes began to operate more overtly in the poetry as time went on. Uh, when I would uh, sort of know what I was doing, a, a great deal of what I've done over the years, I have some, I have this strange feeling that I didn't, I just took what came. You know, uh, I was born this way. Don't know whether it was any good or whether it wasn't any good, didn't matter, that's the way it came. Uh, I think I began taking control of it at a point, some point. Controlling the muse or whatever it was uh, so that I would find myself searching in my mind and then I would be writing line by line. But it, was still, I think it was still, I recognized when the right line came and it would, I would put it down. I think that Maria writes this way. I think that almost everyone who's been writing for many years and who's naturally written, I think this is somewhat similar process. And that is that your mind, your mind is sort of built uh, in this way to, that creates Poetry must be a very ancient thing. Yeah. Hate to tell you something perfectly awful. I was so afraid after I, my this po this poetry thing was such a miracle to me that I was so afraid I would imitate someone that I wouldn't read anyone's poems at all. I read no poetry for many years. That I only have read since I've had to re read poetry since I've been a, an adult after the age of forty. Isn't that dreadful? Well, but, you read but I loved, I loved, I, yes, I loved, uh, I hear a lot of poets, but I didn't, I never, I was so afraid I was going to copy someone right. that I didn't want to. I have a, a terrible uh, mimic in me so that I have to guard against it. Uh, did you read a lot of novels or? Everything. I read so heavily in fiction. I read almost everything in the world. <laughs> Uh, translated a lot of it, but yeah. Mm -hmm. I have read all of Proust long ago, even all of Henry James. Imagine that. <laughs> I have read, uh, I've read all of Jane Austen. I read, just name it, I've read it. I've, I, I have been a, a heavy reader. I learned, start, started reading when I was three. Wow. Well, I didn't start reading. I learned to read when I was three. You know, but I started, I can't remember not reading a lot. I would go to the library and bring home huge um, things of books. I read through the children's library, then I began reading through the adult library, and I read through my grandfather's library, I read through the high school library. I read like a worm, right through. And do you think that that's influenced um, 
not I think not my language not I think I got a huge amount of language from it right mm-hmm I, I, I wasn't conscious of it but uh, yeah and also I'm a mean critic <laughs> I find that hard to mm-hmm. believe <laughs> uh, about prose mm, I'm a mean prose critic mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you look around at what's happening in poetry today uh, and I know you have a poem about a very ironic poem about po biz. Oh, what's your what's your sense of po biz today? I think there are just fabulous young poets writing. Uh, Yolanda here is it Yolanda? Yolanda. Yo- Yo- Joanna. 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 Marvelous. I think that my classes, for instance, your classes everywhere, oh, the stuff you read in magazines. Uh, there are so many wonderful poets largely because women have been added uh, to the poetry world and how and I mean to say I don't think I had that much competition with men looking back now that I look back but women my god they blow you right away they're great women are really natural wonderful poets is this radical of me to talk their, this way? No. Does it say something about a kind of courage? To I think that for one thing, the world of women was not explored uh, before. And so women had this, were almost stock figures in the literary world, as we well know. Uh, and uh, uh, women have come back to, uh, into poetry uh, 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 saying this is not true. Women have written a huge amount of variety and an enormous, and they have been willing to just strip it all off, go naked. Mm. Women have a tremendous amount of nerve. I've been so impressed with it. Yeah. So that I think that I, I am simply, I simply came along early on in this century. There were already wonderful women, but the time I came along, I I bet you if I was coming out right now with my work for the first time, I, would, I wouldn't even make an impression on anyone. Mm-mm. An original is always an original. <laughs> what do you think? Uh, although, is this coming out on this? Is going to be added? You've got to edit. You've got to edit this mad okay. stuff. You should gotta, I, I'm apt to say bad things. No, I think really what you're saying about women is so true. And I think that I remember in 1972 walking through the stacks at Drew and looking at books, great American literary masters, great English masters, and they meant masters, not, not to, there were almost no women. None. In the books. None. They, no, they, I, they, no women in anthologies. Women in, even the women from earlier in the century. Oh, yeah. Uh-uh. And not only that, the, uh, the rules of what was okay for women to do uh, would forbid um, them saying anything like that. I mean, the lid has been blown off. My students say the most outrageous things, but they're good. Right. I, I think that there was a kind of permission that was given. With, when Ginsburg wrote Howell, I think in a way he threw open a door and said anything is possible. That's right. And yeah. women rushed through that door. They really did. <laughs> they rushed through the door. And of course, uh, you know, uh, just being outrageous uh, uh, isn't everything, but uh, it's something. Look at the, this, this stuff that she got up and read. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. marvelous. How yeah. has women's, uh, women writing poetry and women reading poetry, has it? I don't know who's reading it. Probably more people are writing it than are reading it. Although there, you get pretty good crowds at, at poetry readings. Uh, and I think that probably it's getting better. Uh, I don't know um, about book sales and so forth, but and also you realize that in the grade schools they don't teach reading anymore, and they don't have time for reading, and they don't even emphasize reading, but they do emphasize writing. But they don't emphasize reading. I don't think so. I think that's kind of the way it goes in most school systems. You know. Has poetry written by women help the communication between? Man, yeah. I hope. I think it has. I really think it has. Also, the fact that a lot of, um, of, of stuff that has been, I mean, there, it isn't just a um, narrow, acceptable world anymore. Uh, Maria's book is, shows that, uh, your anthology, and it's that way everywhere that, you know, one segment 
of any of the culture isn't speaking for everyone anymore. I think that women helped do that. I know they did. Mm -hmm. And all that variety. Uh -huh. Do you think that uh, you, you really had, how many books did you had published by the time you were 40? You had like none. four books. Absolutely none. none. Oh, no, I, uh, yep, nothing. I had, I was in magazines and I got, I'd been given some awards, prizes and so forth, but um, no. So I had my, book my first out. book came out when I was 41. Uh -huh. Harcourt Brace. Norton. Harcourt Brace. Harcourt never, Brace. Norton okay. was never my publisher. Oh, I know, I keep thinking Norton. Mm -hmm. Harcourt, Harcourt Brace. Brace, and they published, um, I think, three. And then I, then, uh, I went to David Godin, uh, because Norton became uh, one of those corporations that, uh, I think they owned an amusement park. They were all parts of everything. They, were, they became slimy, you know. Uh, and uh, so then I thought, well, David Godin, he's honorable and so forth. But he only likes to do one book, a beautiful book, and it is a beautiful book. It is a beautiful book. And then, uh, so then in order to get um, the book that Phoebe Illustrated published, I went to that little yellow moon, mm -hmm. and they bought, uh, David didn't want to sell it, but I made him, because yeah, he wasn't, repu he didn't, he was going to, I kept putting off bringing it out again. And he, he sold out of that secondhand coat in less than six months was gone. So uh, uh, that little publisher paid David for the um, film and brought it, brought it out. But uh, he doesn't know anything about what he's doing. <laughs> Yellow Moon. So, yeah. So did you, I mean, part of me is, uh, if it, this sounds wrong, but you, your goal wasn't to be a writer. This kind of happened and you just uh, and being a writer and a poet, you, it just happened in the end. Well, let me tell you about it. I, it was, it's like my life went on here, and I loved boys, and I loved going out, and I was very pretty, and, uh, you know, I was just your regular girl. And all, all along was this part of me that read all the time and that wrote all the time, all the time, all the time. So there were these two things. Well, finally, this side, uh, got married and had kids and this I just kept right on doing it and this I kept on I am a mother and a grandmother and I, 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 I have a real lovely uh, hard-working ordinary life uh, you know I'm just I'm a housewife or I was then I became a widow uh, and so forth and all the time there was this other side which just sort of went along parallel to it. I don't know. I can't explain it. It's like I had two rivers. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and it chose you. You didn't choose it. it. Ch huh? It chose you. You didn't choose it. It chose me. Mm-hmm. Yep. Couldn't do anything about it. Mm-mm. Yeah. yeah. I think I'm probably manic depressive a personality. I uh, think I've always was maybe manic depressive. I mean, I wrote on my highs, not my lows. I wrote, I would go extremely high. And th probably that's when it happened. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not psychotic, but you know, I think I have that up down thing. Yeah. What would you say to a person who wants to write or who might think they have a gift to write or read or whatever? Listen listen to themselves that's what I tell my students always listen to yourself listen stop take the time to listen what is going on listen to your own mind it tells you so much and if you give it if you give it permission it'll tell you a lot and it won't just confuse you with noise you know it'll t if you listen I think it's sort of like meditation or it's sort of yeah. like, uh, yeah, alpha waves of meditation. Everyone, I think everyone can do it. I think you're born with this ability. It's just that my mother let it, let me do it, I think, yeah. Also, there happened to be a lot of artists, musicians, and poets in my whole family. My great-grandmother was a poet. I didn't even know this till I was older. Do you think that your life as a woman and the kinds of things that you did and the kinds of uh, uh, 
economic problems that you had and, and, and uh, raising your children and all that, that that contributed to a kind of depth in your poetry that seems to me to oh, be... Well, I think, I think if you go through living and, and through life, we start out pretty, we don't know, we're very, I mean, we think all kinds of things when we're young. I think you, life forces you to learn. You can't avoid it if you live very long. You're forced into it. You learn or else. Mm -hmm. And then you're able to...